Section 3 of Southern Horrors, Lynch Law in All Its Phases. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. Southern Horrors, Lynch Law in All Its Phases by Ida B. Wells. The New Cry. The appeal of Southern whites to Northern sympathy and sanction, the adroit, insidious plea made by Bishop Fitzgerald for suspension of judgment because those who condemn lynching express no sympathy for the white woman in the case, falls to the ground in the light of the foregoing. From this exposition of the race issue in lynch law, the whole matter is explained by the well-known opposition growing out of slavery to the progress of the race. This is crystallized in the oft-repeated slogan, This is a white man's country, and the white man must rule. The South resented giving the Afro-American his freedom, the ballot box, and the civil rights law. The raids of the Ku Klux and white liners to subvert Reconstruction government, the Hamburg and Ellerton, South Carolina, the Copiah County, Mississippi, and the Lafayette Parish, Louisiana massacres, were excused as the natural resentment of intelligence against government by ignorance. Honest white men practically conceded the necessity of intelligence murdering ignorance to correct the mistake of the general government, and the race was left to the tender mercies of the solid South. Thoughtful Afro-Americans, with the strong arm of the government withdrawn, and with the hope to stop such wholesale massacres, urged the race to sacrifice its political rights for sake of peace. They honestly believed the race should fit itself for government, and when that should be done, the objection to race participation in politics would be removed. But the sacrifice did not remove the trouble, nor move the South to justice. One by one, the Southern states have legally disenfranchised the Afro-American and since the repeal of the Civil Rights Bill, nearly every southern state has passed separate car laws with a penalty against their infringement. The race, regardless of advancement, is penned into filthy, stifling partitions cut off from smoking cars. All this while, although the political cause has been removed, the butcheries of black men at Barnwell, South Carolina, Carrollton, Mississippi, Waycross, Georgia, and Memphis, Tennessee, have gone on. Also, the flaying alive of a man in Kentucky, the burning of one in Arkansas, the hanging of a 15-year-old girl in Louisiana, a woman in Jackson, Tennessee, and one in Hollandale, Mississippi, until the dark and bloody record of the South shows 728 Afro-Americans lynched during the past eight years. Not 50 of these were for political causes. The rest were for all manner of accusations, from that of rape of white women to the case of the boy Will Lewis, who was hanged at Tullahoma, Tennessee last year for being drunk and sassy to white folks. These statistics, compiled by the Chicago Tribune, were given the first of this year, 1892. Since then, not less than 150 have been known to have met violent death at the hands of cruel, bloodthirsty mobs during the past nine months. To palliate this record, which grows worse as the Afro-American becomes intelligent, and excuse some of the most heinous crimes that ever stained the history of a country, the South is shielding itself behind the plausible screen of defending the honor of its women. This, too, in the face of the fact that only one-third of the 728 victims to mobs have been charged with rape, to say nothing of those of that one-third who were innocent of the charge. A white correspondent of the Baltimore Sun declares that the Afro-American who was lynched in Chesterton, Maryland, in May, for assault on a white girl, was innocent, that the deed was done by a white man who had since disappeared. The girl herself maintained that her assailant was a white man. When that poor Afro-American was murdered, the whites excused their refusal of a trial on the ground that they wished to spare the white girl the mortification of having to testify in court. This cry has had its effect. It has closed the heart, stifled the conscience, warped the judgment and hushed the voice of press and pulpit on the subject of lynch law throughout this land of liberty. 
men who stand high in the esteem of the public for Christian character, for moral and physical courage, for devotion to the principles of equal and exact justice to all, and for great sagacity, stand as cowards who fear to open their mouths before this great outrage. They do not see that by their tacit encouragement, their silent acquiescence, the black shadow of lawlessness in the form of lynch law is spreading its wings over the whole country. Men who, like Governor Tillman, start the ball of lynch law rolling for a certain crime are powerless to stop it when drunken or criminal white toughs feel like hanging an Afro-American on any pretext. Even to the better class of Afro-Americans, the crime of rape is so revolting they have too often taken the white man's word, and given lynch law neither the investigation nor condemnation it deserved. They forget that a concession of the right to lynch a man for a certain crime not only concedes the right to lynch any person for any crime, but, so frequently is the cry of rape now raised, it is in a fair way to stamp us a race of rapists and desperadoes. They have gone on hoping and believing that general education and financial strength would solve the difficulty, and are devoting their energies to the accumulation of both. The mob spirit has grown with the increasing intelligence of the Afro-American. It has left the out-of-the-way places where ignorance prevails, has thrown off the mask, and with this new cry stalks in broad daylight in large cities, the centers of civilization, and is encouraged by the leading citizens and the press. End of Section 3 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista